Welcome to the Instant Wilderness Podcast. I am your host, Byron Pace. It is the 25th of June, 2020, and my interview today with Dr. Amy Dickman was recorded just a couple of weeks ago. This is truly an eye-opening discussion to the very heart of what makes conservation work. Amy is a Kaplan Senior Research Fellow at Field Conservation in the Department of Zoology at Oxford University, as well as sitting on the IUCN Cat Specialist Group. So much of our chat today centres around her work with big cats, but we dig deep into how conservation can be made sustainable in the long term, as well as the complexities of human-wildlife conflict and the common insensitivity of conservation interactions with local communities. We talk about the importance of compassion and humanity in our efforts to conserve wild spaces and the necessity to implement an international value to resources if we want to protect them. We finish up our chat talking about the famous picture of her holding her young child on stage at a National Geographic conference and what challenges she faced being a woman in conservation. So much awesome stuff here. But before we get to that, the winner from two weeks ago, where I gave you the chance to win a copy of Modern Huntsman, any volume you wanted. This is made possible because of our collaboration with Modern Huntsman, where I am also the international editor alongside an amazing team headed up by editor-in-chief Tyler Sharp. I asked you all to rate and review this show, and the winner picked from those of you who did is C. Lin, who kindly wrote... I first found the Pace Brothers podcast when they were talking about snipe migration a few years back and was hooked instantly. They managed to make every episode fun and engaging, and you will always learn something about wildlife and land management. Excellent work. Well, thank you very much, C. Lynn. If you want to contact me, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com, I will get a copy of Modern Huntsman out to you. For this week, to win any volume of Modern Huntsman of your choosing, I would like to see a tag post somewhere on social, absolutely anywhere on social, of you listening to the show. Now, this doesn't have to be a picture of your face listening to it. Just show me where you listen to the podcast. Uh, You can tag at Pace Brothers Film on Facebook. You can tag at Byron J. Pace on either Instagram or Twitter. Or you can send an email, podcast at paceproductionsuk.com. And I will pick a winner possibly at random, or maybe the coolest picture that I get tagged in. I haven't decided yet, but somebody will win a copy. Now, sometimes I forget to mention that all of our awesome podcast listeners can also get 15% off all Modern Huntsman products on our shop on the pacebrothers.com. Click shop. In the drop down, you'll find Modern Huntsman. So you can get 15% off anything in that category with the promo code into the wilderness. And with volume five and all the other pre-orders shipping out to the UK pretty soon, uh, this is a perfect opportunity to use that promo code. Last thing before we jump into the show, a shout out to our top tier patrons, who this week are Richard Stevens, Richard McNeil, Ronnie Speakman of rdcontracting.co.uk, Tom McCraith, James Benjamin Normandale, James Marchington, the team at South Ayrshire Stalking, Josh Starling, Sean Rowan, James Albin Corbin, Thomas Cameron, and Mark Zabrowski. If you want to help support the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash Pace Brothers, and you can have a look at the various support tiers. There is some pretty cool swag that we send out, uh, depending on the tier that you sign up to. Uh, Oh, there is one other thing, and that is that sadly I have to mention that the Northern Shooting Show, which we have mentioned periodically, uh, that was going to be happening this year and then was postponed to later in the year, has been cancelled for 2020, but it will be happening with any luck in 2021. The full details of this are on northernshootingshow.co.uk. Sad that it's not happening this year, but it's a decision that's been made by a lot of shows, so we have it to look forward to next year. Okay, that really is it this time. I welcome Amy Dickman to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Amy, welcome to the Into the Wilderness podcast. Great to have you on today. I would normally expect you to be somewhere in the field in Africa, but you're locked down in the UK, I'm guessing, like everyone else? 
I am indeed. I am hiding out under my daughter's bunk bed at the moment, trying to avoid my <laughs> two-year-old and five-year-old for long enough to do the podcast. <laughs> You've created a little sound studio there. <laughs> exactly. My husband is with them for anyone who's concerned out there. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, today, we're, we're going to be talking a lot about big cat conservation. That's going to be the, the core and like main thrust of, uh, of our discussion. Uh, but before we like really get into that, there's a lot of groups and organizations and titles and things that you're involved in. I really want to find out about how you got this interest from a young age, what what drew you to where your fascination lies now. But, but before we do that, just as a, a way of overview, tell me what, what you're involved in, the, the links between Oxford University, your research in Tanzania, IUCN. We'll dig into all of that a little bit later, but just as a sort of a broad overview so people can understand the kind of work that you're doing and the organizations you're involved in. Yeah, so I am the Kaplan Senior Research Fellow at Oxford University. That's a fellowship held at Pembroke College. And it's held at the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, which is part of Oxford Zoology Department. And through that, the remit of the fellowship, which I first got in 2009, was simply to set up an internationally significant conservation project. So it was very broad, could have been anything the focus they wanted to be on big cats. And so then I chose the Ruaha landscape, which I, in southern Tanzania, which is where I had worked for my master's and my PhD. So through the fellowship, I set up the Ruaha Carnival Project. And it's been going on now for just over 10 years through Oxford. Mm-hmm. And you also sit uh, within a group in the IUCN as well? Yes. Yeah, so lots of people, you know, as you gain expertise or as you persuade people you have some expertise, the two may not be the same. Uh, people actually invite you, you know, obviously onto different groups. So I'm part of the IUCN uh, Cat Specialist Group, the African Lion Working Group, which is now affiliated with the Cat Specialist Group. And then you build up relationships, obviously, over time with lots of different organisations. We have funders from across the world and organisations like National Geographic have been really key in our funding. So through that, I became a National Geographic explorer through their grantee programme. So you build up this sort of network of different organisations that you interact with all the time. So how, how long has this been your life? It's, is it it's like 20 years or more? Yeah, just over 20 years. So I first went out wow. in Africa when I was 21. Um, very, yeah, oh my God, I look back at those pictures now and I was so young and just keen and enthusiastic. You know, some of that is still true, not so young anymore, but, um, <laughs> but <clears throat> it was just such a amazing privilege to get out there. I mean, it was something I'd been passionate about doing for as long as I can remember. You know, I've, I'd always wanted to work with big cats and my brother and I found a memory box that we'd buried uh, saying what we wanted to be doing at the unimaginable age of 30. So when we wrote it, when I was about 10. And mine only had two things on it. It said, I wanted to be studying lions in the Serengeti, and I wanted to have a zebra-striped Land Rover. So those are my two sort of life dreams. Uh, I think those are two amazing ambitions. I mean, I, <laughs> I might, I'm being a Land Rover fan, I, I think the, probably the zebra-striped Land Rover might have been slightly higher <laughs> for me. <laughs> but a zebra-striped Land Rover in Africa, I think would have I been know. my cap. Yeah. <laughs> I but know. at 10 years like, old, that's like so <laughs> insightful. Well, it was just funny. I mean, I said, now I have like seven broken down land roads in the field, much so <laughs> uh, constantly in need of fixing. So, uh, yeah, I just need at some point to paint one zebra striped and then I will have achieved my goals. That's it. You've done. Like you can <laughs> you can retire happy once you get your zebra striped land rover. Exactly. So, uh, You've you've started there at a, at a very young age. Is there was there any thing in your in your upbringing up to that age that gave you this enthusiasm for something which you clearly pursued to exactly the point that you had foreseen as a young ten year old? I know it's funny because I remember thinking that I I spent my thirtieth actually in the Serengeti watching lions, and I have a great picture of me with a bottle of champagne, thinking how crazy that it all these things led there, you know, and it wasn't a seamless journey in any way. There is no route to this. And I think it's so frustrating when you talk to people today, and they say, how do I get there? And there's no route map. It's not like you're becoming a medical doctor and you say, you know, you start off as a junior physician and you progress in this linear way. It's it's very much about who you meet and your experiences and, and to a large extent, luck, which is so frustrating because people think you're not telling them the secret. But I think from, I had a passion for it and there's nothing it wasn't like I went to Africa when I was five and I fell in love with it. I mean, I, I'd always been passionate about big cats. My mother has a picture of me where I meant to be giving my younger sister a bottle and she must be about, I don't know, I guess one maybe. And 
I'm feeding her, but I'm not really feeding her at all. She's just lolling over the edge of the sofa and I'm completely <laughs> ignoring her and I'm reading this big book of big cats. And it was, just, <laughs> it was just a fascination. I remember going to the zoo. That was probably one of the biggest uh, things, you know, places I could actually obviously get close to them and watching these incredible animals. And that, that feeling when you look at a big cat and you realize they are so beautiful and so majestic and they can kill you. And I think that fascination has obviously been so strong for all of humans through all of our all of our history and it's just something that's still very innate in us now and i've just been really fortunate to be able to make it into a career hmm. so what what was your route having left school what, what did you study yeah so at school i studied you know the classic science a levels um biology chemistry physics and maths lots of fun uh and then i when my school was very academic and they were great, they're a wonderful school. Um, but they were very that people should go into, you know, uh, sorry, medical field, so to become a doctor or a vet or a lawyer potentially. So when I talked about zoology, it wasn't really seen as an obvious end point for someone to have a, a defined career in. So then I looked at becoming a veterinary surgeon and essentially going down that route. But for a long time, it just then I really thought I don't actually just want to be dealing with sick wild animals or maybe in a zoo. I do want to try going out there. So I then went to um, Liverpool University to study a zoology degree. But even there, even in the heart of a zoology degree, I remember my lecturers saying to me when I said I wanted to go out to Africa and study big cats, they would say, well, what's your plan B? And I'd say, why, why are we <laughs> skipping straight over plan A? Like, yeah, what I don't want a plan B. This is what I want to do. Yeah, this is what I want to do. And I remember vividly them saying to me, there are no jobs in that. And I thought, there must be some jobs in it. So anyway, so I ignored that a bit. And for my undergraduate project, I chose to do a project on the captive breeding of cheetahs. So we were given a list of projects. And I said, can I do something different? And they enabled you to have an open sort of choice one. So I remember sitting at Chester Zoo and watching the cheetahs for ages. And it was interesting because during that, I wrote to lots of big cat specialists, including through the IUCN cat specialist group, and emailing them all and saying, A, can you give me some information about cheetahs? And B, can you give me career information? And very, very few of them wrote back. I realise now, of course, because everyone's so busy. But Laurie Marker did write back and she was the head of the International Cheetah Stud Book. And she was very, you know, very forthcoming in what she shared. And also she was good at sort of saying, this is something you can do. And it was interesting that after getting my degree, I then was looking around for something to do. And then it turned out to be, it is true. There are no jobs in this field. So uh, <laughs> I was sort of at a slight loss. And I was really lucky in terms of the timing because I saw at the back of uh, New Scientist magazine there was an advert for the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit to have recent British graduates go and join them. And this was literally, I mean, the dream. If I had been able to pick one place I would have studied, it would have been Wild Crew. I had known of David MacDonald, who runs it, and you know, I'd read the books. I'd watched The Velvet Claw about predators. I, I was fascinated. So it was literally the best potential opportunity. And I was so excited to go up to Oxford and to have a, a um, an interview with them. And I remember going up to Oxford, having this interview, it went really, really well. It was David and quite a few other people. But I managed to completely mess it up at some point by mistaking corvids, which are um, crows with cervids, yeah. which are deer. That was a problem. <laughs> and made me look like a really terrible zoologist. But despite that, they somehow saw some sort of uh, potential. And I went and joined Wild Crew there. And that was really the start of it. And and after about a year of doing UK work where they kept saying, you know, you could work on water voles or water shrews or all these things. And I did some of that. But I really wanted to go out to Africa. And I was on the cusp of leaving there to go and join the Meerkat project at Cambridge um, just to get some African experience. Because Every job I saw wants an African experience. And then David said, no, we've got this woman joining who's finishing her PhD or doing her PhD. And she would like some assistance out in the field. You know, what about that? And it turned out to be Laurie Marker working on the cheetahs in Namibia. So it was a really interesting oh, thing we had this contact already and i went out there for what was meant to be six months and turned into six years working with laurie in namibia six years so where in namibia were you so the ccf is based in ochivarongo but you would travel oh, yeah. all over I, the country I, I spend a lot of time in in that area because a friend oh, of mine has a, a very big farm there where is that uh that's uh mount etchu okay so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. annette olofsson and, yeah. and alex yeah. No, I love Namibia. I was just talking the other day about getting our young kids back there soon just to sort of experience it. I do love Namibia. What was the work that you were doing there? So, so that was six years based primarily in Namibia. Yeah, so yeah, six years based in Namibia. Um, and that was all sort of conflict work. So on commercial farmland where obviously 
there's a lot of uh, people raising both game and livestock, and then large carnivals are a problem. In most of those places, the lions have been extirpated, but cheetahs and leopards are obviously you know, important carnivores, both for game and for livestock. So there was an awful lot of conflict with commercial farmers, and we would go out and we would respond to that conflict, try to bring in cheetahs that had been captured by farmers, try to re-release them, track them. So I was doing quite a lot of the ecological work there, working with the livestock guarding dogs, and it really was absolutely central to me in giving me this baseline. First of all, I loved the way that Laurie dealt with it because she wasn't judgmental towards the farmers, even though there was so much cheetah killing going on. Um, she really understood that it was very challenging to be a farmer out there and to have these large carnivores on your land eating your assets. So I was trying to work out ways of which where you could improve that coexistence and and find new solutions rather than just making them the enemy. So I think that's never the way forward. From that point to now, what um, systems have been put in place there to help ease the conflict of cheetah predation for farmers or, or in the, at the very least, compensate? Was it only cheetahs you were looking at? Because there's a similar kind of story going on with, with leopards there as well. It was mainly cheetahs, but certainly we dealt with leopards as well to some extent. So farmers would call about leopards as well. There'd be other organisations like Africat who were there who would also work more with the leopards. But we certainly got called for both and we did work with both to some extent. So in terms of the conflict mitigation there, it was a lot about just readjusting the costs and the benefits of having large carnivores on the land. So the first and the most obvious is reducing those costs. How do you make the carnivores that are there less of a direct threat to your livestock? And that was things like placing livestock guarding dogs. That was a really important thing because actually they're very effective dogs um, with cheetahs. And so this was both communal and commercial farmers going out and placing puppies, ensuring they knew how to treat them within the livestock, you know, how they, what problematic behaviours they should look out for and how they would get a dog that was protective and attentive of the livestock. So that's been a really successful programme over there. Uh, making sure just simple things like you have human guardians with them, you keep them in good enclosures. So there are fairly simple, effective steps you can make in somewhere like Namibia to help people reinforce uh, their enclosures and protect their livestock. But obviously, no one is going to put up with carnivores if they're just a slightly lower risk. That doesn't make any sense for people. You've got to make sure that the benefits outweigh the costs. And so in Namibia is one of the places where I'd first realized the issue of trophy hunting. And having gone over as very much a, you know, a newbie, a very animal loving, quite animal rights leaning person, this idea that Laurie could see there was some value in the trophy hunting of cheetahs, this species that she was absolutely fixated on, was really amazing to me, but it really showed when we talked to farmers that they were willing to put up with the presence of cheetahs on their land if there was a chance that they might then be able to trophy hunt a cheetah and get a significant amount of revenue from it. So it was worth... This is, just an, this is just an economic compensation aspect. Exactly. So it's not directly compensation, obviously, for the livestock kills, but it's the idea of, yeah, at a bigger level, you have the, the chance of getting a value from that animal rather than just a pure cost or the risk of a cost. So those things were happening as well. And then they, they've done other quite innovative things, something called bush block there, which is, I know I don't know if you know, there's obviously invasive bush that is spreading across mm. large parts of Namibia. That's bad for the farmers. It's, it's difficult. Yeah, for they do a lot of debushing. You see it everywhere there. Exactly. So they were coming up with quite a, a sort of um, an environmentally friendly way of clearing the bush, but also having these agreements with the farmers. So they would get a premium of selling it as these sort of, you know, cheetah friendly product if the farmers then signed up to sort of, more of the coexistence strategies that are happening in Namibia. So it, it was just working out ways, listening to the farmers of what they needed and trying to come up with ways that they could have those benefits delivered more through conservation. And have we, what, what, what have the numbers told us on the back of the work that w was implemented at that time going forward to today? Do we have, are there more cheetah in, in Namibia? Certainly from things that I've seen Laurie you know, share recently, I think they think the numbers have probably stabilised there. There's huge amounts of killing and the killing has gone down significantly on those farms. There was, you know, the amount of killing was just staggering of the cheetah killing. So that's certainly tailed off. Whether the numbers have actually increased at a countrywide level, obviously cheetahs and other large carnivals are very hard to survey in an effective way. And you'd have to put a huge amount of resources into doing an effective survey. So I think the best thing we can probably say is that if we significantly reduce the key threats to them, then the likelihood is that at least those with those threats reduced, that you know, you're going to have the population stabilize and hopefully over time grow. But I don't know if there's particularly, you know, robust science showing that they've increased, you know, as a direct result of those things. It's very hard to tease those things out. 
Mm. And this story of, of human wildlife conflict, which I, I know is what you spend a lot of your time um, or have, have spent a lot of your time researching, is a story that is replicated a, across almost the entire continent. I, I mean, not just in Africa, we see it in, in almost all parts Absolutely. of the world, but mm -hmm. uh, in terms of your, your area of research and where you spend most of your time, we're, we're seeing this across most of Africa. There's a difference between this and uh, the poaching element when we're, we're talking about uh, ivory and rhino horn. I think sometimes it gets uh, mixed up and it's slightly confusing to understand the, these web of conflicts that exist there. I imagine yeah. you took a lot of what you learned there to implement in when you ended up in Tanzania. What was your, what was your next step after your six years in Namibia? What, what happened between there and um, this, where your, the next journey began in Tanzania? So I knew that much as I was loving the time in Namibia and I'd learned a huge amount through Laurie, I did always have this sort of desire, this itch to get back out or get out. I'd never been actually to East Africa. And I still had this sort of dream of the Serengeti. And it turned out very randomly, I came back to a Canterbury to a Society for Conservation Biology conference and uh, happened to be sitting out and this woman walked up and she sat down and we started chatting and it turned out to be Sarah Durant who ran the Serengeti Cheetah Project. And, you know, she and I had communicated remotely a bit because, you know, well, we were obviously in the same cheetah field to some extent, but I didn't know her. And she was, you know, this sort of goddess to me of another of these big names in conservation. So it was amazing to meet with her and we started talking. And I talked about the fact that I, I'd always had this dream of going out and I wanted to do maybe a master's or a PhD um, and go out to Serengeti. And she said, well, why don't you come out, you know, and see our project and see what you think of the Serengeti, which was just this incredible opportunity. So, I, you know, I talked with Laurie. Laurie was very supportive. I went out to see the Cheetah Project. And I remember thinking, this is absolutely fantastic. I mean, it is everything I wanted. You would drive out in the morning, you know, you might swing by a nice lodge, drive out and the cheetahs would jump up on the car and you'd, you know, identify them. It was just, it was a lovely, beautiful, I mean, Serengeti is as spectacular as I thought it ever would be. Um, you know, the people were lovely. Uh, there was chilled champagne at the lodges. <laughs> it, was <literally, laughs> it was literally this like perfect scenario. And so then Sarah asked if I wanted to do my master's and potentially a PhD with her. And I jumped at the chance. Um, and it was, you know, and Laurie was really very supportive. And actually they funded it, which was so lovely for the, for the master's. So there's a real support of going over there. But just as I sort of signed on the dotted line, I said, you know, I'm so excited about starting in Serengeti. Sarah said, oh, no, we don't need more people in Serengeti. There's way too many people here. We need people in Ruaha. And I'd never heard of Ruaha. So I was a bit thrown. And she basically said, you know, just drive in sort of 20 hours in that direction until you hit the swamp <laughs> and that's it. And I was thinking, what? So, <laughs> so I set off in the oldest Land Rover known to man, which is actually a German imported one. So it's obviously a uh, sort of left-hand drive and made those that drive very, you know, extremely dangerous. We, we got stranded. We ended up getting rescued by Catholic nuns, which is myself and this sort of older Tanzanian guy. We could barely speak a word between us. Um but anyway, headed off, finally ended up in Ruaha. And at the time, there was a small uh, wildlife conservation society camp down there. Uh, and so I went and joined them. But it was right on the edge. It was very, very wild. And, and I remember thinking, because I'd expressed this interest in moving away just from cheetahs to do sort of all large carnivores and a particular area with lions. And Ruaha is known as one of the strongholds for lions. So yet there was no really dedicated carnivore work going on there. So it was a perfect opportunity. But, but yeah, I remember that first night out there as sort of the sun was setting and the hyenas were calling and I heard the lions start to roar and it just there was this real chill down me of thinking oh my goodness you know I've, I've talked about this for you know over a decade now and finally and you're I'm here, here now and you wow. know and how is it going to be you know is it going to be is it going to be just, at that moment I just felt scared and intimidated so yeah you know you can so much at, at that point there was so much expectation because you're you're now most definitely on the path of what the 10 year old version of yourself wanted for the 30 year old oh, version absolutely. of yourself to achieve and now it's there it's like it's it's in front of you uh, and i i can i can see how there would be this trepidation that is it everything you would hope it would be and what and, an incredible and will you be good enough? journey yeah and will you be good enough to do it i remember my very first day my very first day in, um, in namibia and waking up in the morning, we had these um, sort of dormitories with glass doors. And I went to open the door to go out for my first day of like proper field work in Africa. And I saw this one hairy leg sort of 
peeking up and I looked down and realized there was this huge tarantula type spider on the door. <laughs> and I was just completely freaked out because I'd never seen anything like it. And, uh, and I realized that if I opened the door, then it would probably drop into my bedroom. And I thought I can never sleep in here again. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> I thought I can't, I'm here as a wildlife researcher. I can't be trapped in my room by an invertebrate. So I sort of looked around hastily and uh, then climbed out of the window and gently nudged it off the <laughs> stick. <laughs> Thank God I was on the ground floor. <laughs> Uh, that's amazing and so cool to be able to just you know, 20 hours south so so ruha is that's in the south of tanzania yeah yeah is that great to be given a land rover until go go forth that's where we need research i mean it's the stuff that dream and then be rescued by catholic nuns it's the <laughs> stuff that storybooks are made out of definitely i know it is yeah. ridiculous looking back and actually that very first night in in Aura, as you say, it's all out there. Now there's this potential path towards you fulfilling your dreams. But, and as that happens, the pressure's on you get higher and higher. You know, will you, be, will you be able to do it? Will you be good? Will you enjoy it? And if you don't enjoy it, can you walk away from this dream? It's, you know, something you've talked about so much, you do raise the expectations. So I, but I remember lying there that first night and, um, and I heard these lions roaring and it was beginning to panic me. And I thought, this is ridiculous. You've said for years you want to work on lions. And here you are in a little tiny, tiny pup tent and there are lions around. But really, I swear, in the day you are 5% primal terrified human and 95% trained biologist. And at night, it's completely the other way around. And so as soon as the sun set and it was dark and I was hearing these lions roaring, it's just I got absolutely terrified. And the lion roar was getting closer and closer. And eventually I thought, well, they're really coming close. And I thought I bet I could make it to the Land Rover in time because it wasn't parked that far away. And I had my hand on the zip. And this roar sort of, you know, shattered the the bush and the the night sounds. And I thought, well, uh, that day we'd been out to see an attack of lions on a cattle enclosure. And if they can't get into a cattle enclosure, if it's quite secure, what they do is they walk around and around it until the lions are so freaked out. Sorry, the cattle are so freaked out that they break out and then the lions kill them. So I remember having my hand on this zip and thinking, be more intelligent than a cow. Just do not, <laughs> do not run out to where the lions are and uh, forced myself to lie back down and found weapons in my bag because this lion clearly was very close. I mean, when they're really close and they roar, you know, you can feel it rather than hear it. And I yeah, found like in my bag. Yeah, you feel it in your chest. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So I found my uh, Leatherman knife with this little three-inch blade and a can of That's optimistic. Spray. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that was my weapon. And actually he ended up, this lion walked up and ended up circling the tent, walking right around it, sniffing it, and ended up, lying on it and uh, going to sleep on it which was interesting and then when you woke up in the morning he was gone i assume yeah absolutely i mean he just lay on me sort of lay on the hand with a knife so i was left with just a deodorant spray which is a terrible lion killer but you know um, <laughs> that was needed um, i mean that <laughs> I, I think I'll, uh, it takes a lot to be calm enough to know that you just have to stay there in that situation <laughs> even with all the training and knowledge that you would have had it was more, honestly, there was an element of, A, you've got a giant lion lying on you. So it's quite a physical, <laughs> quite a physical uh, <laughs> pressure to make you stay there. And I do remember this urge to get out, even at that point. And thinking maybe I'll dig down the hand because I was lying on sand and maybe I can free myself. But you are thinking there's just no way, you know, let sleeping cats lie. You know, there's no point waking it up. He's now fast asleep. And yeah, you are battling the primal side and the trained side of you. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. So was that, that was your initiation to this place 20 miles, yeah. 20 hours from nowhere? Yes, that was my first night. That was fun. Wow. <laughs> Talk about breaking the ice. So <laughs> yeah. um, what, what, what was there for you? What, what, were you? what did you end up really getting, getting your teeth into? What did you find when daylight lifted um, in, in terms of the the landscape uh, and the wildlife that was there and the issues that you were going to be dealing with. Yeah. So this was at Lunda. And this was, as I said, this small WCS research camp with a researcher called Pete Coppolillo and his family. And it was great. There was this, and it's a spectacularly beautiful area. It's right on the edge of the Great Ruaha River. Um, you know, elephants would come every day. There were hippos. There were huge crocodiles that would lie outside my um, shower and just, you know, prevent you from having a shower. Um, everything. It was just full of wildlife and it was an amazing place to be, really as spectacular as you dream of as a child, you know. Um, but my job, and I, you know, I wanted to understand more about the conflict. And so I was driving in each day to the local villages. And there are these small villages scattered around, very rural, lots of pastoralists, um, very, very sort of low-key African villages. And 
I would go in there and you know, through the translator talk to these households about their perceptions of large carnivores, how many problems they were having, and was this leading to actually a conservation issue? And certainly the masters and the PhD showed that there was lots and lots of reported conflict, lots of reported attacks on people's livestock, and they didn't like them. Uh, they generally wanted them gone, but nobody actually said they were killing them. Well, very, very few people. We very occasionally found the carcass of a killed carnivore or or people would mention that a carnivore had been killed. But to me, the lingering impression, alongside just the amazing resilience of these communities living with these very, very challenging animals, was that it, there seemed a real mismatch between what I was being told about the conflict and the degree of killing that was probably going on. And so after my PhD there, I got a fellowship back at Wild Crew because my PhD had been through uh, ZSL and UCL. Um, so when I went, I, this opportunity came up at Wild Crew and I got the fellowship there, which, as I said, to start this internationally significant conservation project. So I said to them, we've done the groundwork for this project here. We know there's lots of reported conflict, but I suspect there's a lot more real killing and a lot we haven't even scraped the surface of. So I want to be based actually right in the heart of village land. So where the original camp was, was in this slightly sort of protected area um, edge of it. But I wanted to be right on a village land so that we could really understand the perceptions of the villagers and really see if we could detect how much killing was going on and try to put in place conservation solutions to reduce that killing. Hmm. And what did what did you find when you when you went back there and now you started this like next phase of of your research? What what was the reality on the ground and how if, if there was a, an increased amount of killing that you weren't aware of? How I, I'm, I'm intrigued to know how uh, lions were being killed and if it mm -hmm. always was in retaliation for taking yeah. cattle or or members of of the village. Yeah, so when we first went back, it was myself and two Tanzanians that started up this project and we had no money. We didn't even have a car at the time. So someone lent us this extremely old, battered, that sort of Hilux that was, <laughs> that was just the source of jokes all around the place that these, you know, white Westerners, you know, turned off in this terrible, terrible car. <laughs> but um, we would basically went up and we asked one of the local villagers because we, having known through the PhD that there was a lot of killing, apparently, when people talked about it, especially if you heard at bars and things, people would talk about the Barabeg being the ones who are the most hostile towards large carnivores. And this is a tribe that is a sister tribe to the Maasai, um, but they're much more secretive and much more hostile, at least in this area. So they're known locally as Mangati, which means the enemy. They just very much kept themselves themselves. So all of the pointers suggested that we should try to set the camp up somewhere where we would have access to the Barabeg. And so we found this one village called Kitsisi that is an amazing little village um, and has lots of Barabeg living there. And they said, OK, you know, you can be based here and do what you want. So we just set up these three tiny tents under a tree. And the whole point was then was to really just try to listen and to understand and talk to people about the killing going on. Unfortunately, it was very true that the Barabeg were extremely hostile, extremely secretive. Uh, no one would engage with this at all. You know, we would go up to Barabeg households and they would run away. Uh, we would try to call meetings and no one would come. Uh, we talked to other villagers quite a lot and we would find quite a lot of carcasses around. There was clearly quite a bit of killing going on. But again, when people talked about the Barabeg, we couldn't get them to engage at all. And literally that went on for two years. And we got wow. to the point where where we were just thinking, this is impossible. We are not going to be able to do this. And you know, this was meant to be a five-year project originally. And two years in, we haven't even got the main group of people to talk to us. And then we ended up putting up solar panels for the first time at camp. So until then, we'd been charging things off car batteries. And we put these solar panels up to charge our laptops. And uh, and suddenly, the Barabeg arrived to charge their mobile phones, which, <laughs> which just... Um, to this day, I kick myself for not thinking of that earlier because of you course. found that you found the common language. I we know. all need energy exactly. well, these days. We all need energy. We all need energy, and our cell phones are really important to us. So yeah. they started turning up. It wasn't like an immediate breakthrough, but they would come to the camp. Then there was a real reason for them to come. So suddenly, there's a charging station. They had to walk, you know, many kilometers before to charge their phones. So they would come, and they it was broke down some of the original. Uh, fear that was around us. And eventually, uh, they invited us down to their tribal meeting after a long period of time. But this was after one night when we were sitting in camp. And I remember hearing what was clearly the celebration of a lion kill going on. So people were singing and dancing and banging their spears, and you could hear them making lion noises. And we thought that has to be the celebration of a kill. So it was about 11 o'clock at night, and we thought, let's just put on our, you know, shoes and get out there and go and see what's going on. So we walked off through the bush to this to try and reach this homestead. 
and there were the three of us. I remember right halfway up, it was a very dark night. It was moonlit, but very cloudy. And there's about, we were halfway up to this household. We suddenly, all three of us stopped and you got that prickling feeling on the back of your neck that something was watching you, that there was danger around. And I thought, is it a lion? Is it a hyena? What is it? And suddenly the clouds parted and this moonlight came down and we were entirely surrounded by a group of warriors with their spears up. And, um, and they said, you know, we were like, who defeated, you know, in research. And one of them, the guy, the main guy who stepped forward, Shabani, was like, what were you doing? We were about to kill you. You know, we thought you were here to steal our cattle. And then we, we didn't realize there'd been a whole cattle rustling conflict going on between the Maasai and the Barabeg. Okay. And, but they said, we, we realized you were making so much noise. There's no way you were Maasai. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just tramping through the bush. Uh, and so anyway, so they said, I said, what on earth are you doing out here trying to get yourself killed? And we said, we want to talk to you about this. We want to understand your perspectives of, of lion killing and why you do it. And so finally they said, okay, now we'll come and talk to you. If you're really this serious about it, we'll come and talk. So then we had a really good meeting with them at the camp. And they just explained that, you know, there were lots of different elements to the killing. Yes, a lot of it is about protecting their livestock. And livestock have immense economic and cultural value in these communities. But also it was beyond that. It was very tied up with the status um, of being a warrior, that this is something you do as a warrior and that they were having gifts given to them amongst the communities if a young man would go out and spear a lion. So the guy who was the first spear, the person who would kill, who would, sorry, uh, throw the spear that first hit the lion, even if that one didn't kill it, they were the ones that were awarded by the rest of the community. So they would cut off the paw and they would take it around as a proof of kill and they would get gifts of cattle. So the young men would say, this is about the only way that we can get these, our cattle herds built up and it's the only way we get women to sort of take notice of us. We've suddenly got cattle, we've got status. So all these things were driving them. And they saw no benefit to having wildlife around, particularly beyond killing it. The only benefit they saw in lions was being able to kill them. And they also had no idea about the wider conservation issues. You know, the fact that lions were really threatened, that Ruaha was really important for them, that their impacts can actually be having a global, you know, ripple effect was absolute news to them. It's a, it's a very big ask to expect um, a very remote community to have a, a global view and appreciation Absolutely. on a, a species level across the continent. They know what is on their doorstep and what they mm -hmm. deal with on a day-to-day -day basis and how they survive on a day-to-day -day basis, which is through the food that uh, they either harvest or the livestock that they keep. And the direct threat to that, along with uh, the cultural importance, as you were just explaining, means yep. that lions have no benefit. And I think this goes to a lot of the, the conversations around conservation anywhere in the world, which is that we need mechanisms which help create value in maintaining ecosystems and the wildlife within them, because that is how you almost, and this is this is a, feels like a really terrible way to put it, but it's almost the way that we give um, these species the right to exist in a landscape where we as humans are increasingly taking taking over it because if they don't have a value to us the way that the world works right now we find something else to do with that landscape that will create a value for us totally people want value from things and i know there are many people we get into lots of you know philosophical discussions about this that it should just be that everything is is valued for their intrinsic value and their intrinsic yeah. right to exist. That would be that, lovely. That, that's a lovely, that's a lovely a, view of the world. <laughs> it is lovely. But I keep saying to those people when they say to me, I'm like, I would love that too. You know, I would love to see the amazing intrinsic value of lions and every other bit of wildlife from a ladybird up valued for its intrinsic value. But in this world right now, we have had lions halve in the last 20 years. You know, we have got to deal with the reality of right now, which is where people, particularly desperately poor people, will need actual tangible value and benefits. And if we can't deliver that through the protection of wildlife and wild places, which I really believe we can, by the way, but if we don't do that, then it will be delivered through agriculture, through mining, through settlement. And, and that we lose such an opportunity to to really translate the massive international value of these species down to the local level and incentivize its protection there. I think we have to do it. So how did those discussions go? How did you, it's very difficult to um, change the, the cultural inertia of traditions like you've described in the same way as 
we can't expect uh, the use of traditional Chinese medicine to change overnight just because we show Western science to show that there is absolutely no benefit to rhino horn. That is something that requires education over a very long period of time. And even then, it's a huge ask because we're talking about something which is ingrained in the very fabric of who these people are for tens of thousands of years. So how, how on earth did you go about broaching this conversation in a way that wasn't sort of insulting to the people that they are? Yeah. So I think this is really interesting because lots of people, and I think particularly conservationists, back away as soon as there are cultural elements involved. And I mm, yeah. had that feeling straight away. We think, oh, you can't change cultures. Cultures are these immutable, uh, just facets of a society. Actually, I really think you can change cultures very quickly if there is a need for people to do it. I often look at things like the cell phone we just talked about or the internet. These have hugely changed our culture you know, in an extremely short space of time because it was valuable for people to make that change. So again, it's back to value about how do you make a change attractive to someone? So you're not forcing it upon them. All of this has to be done with people's choice and free will. So if you just try to impose other decisions, other values on them, it just won't work. It will, they will ignore it. It will be driven underground. You will just get cut out of the discussion. So, and I think what you've got to get to is at the heart of it, why are people doing it? We often look at the end point. So the end point here was that they were killing lions. But that wasn't, that, it always wasn't why they were, the reason why they were killing lions was multifaceted. They were trying to protect their livestock. They were trying to get wealthy enough so they had secure households. They were trying to get the attention of women and trying to fulfill this need to be a warrior. So in all of those things, like we talked extensively with them about what it means to be a warrior. Now, killing a lion is part of being a warrior, but all it does is, is, a, is a symbolism of, of what it means to be a warrior. And and when they're talking about that, they would say, you know, we need to be the brave people in the community. We need to be the guardians. And there's a real sense that that they were losing this identity in in being a Barabeg warrior in particular. And so we talked about other mechanisms. We said, what if, for instance, we enabled you to all get money through conservation so each of you can actually go and buy your cattle? Because one of the things we realized with the lion killing that was happening was that it was only the one, the first spear that would often get uh, get the cattle, got to get the women. So even within that discussion and the cultural discussion, there was some tension going on that those costs and benefits were not being equally distributed. So we said to them, what if we employed more of you to do it? And they were very keen to have different opportunities for more of them to get cattle. So we worked with the group Lion Guardians up in Kenya, and they came down here and we adapted a this very culturally appropriate thing in very close partnership with the Barabay. So they were going out and tracking lions every day. They would warn people. They would warn households if lions were around. They would chase lions away from households. They were seen as these guys that were protecting the community. So they were being warriors and they were being increasingly respected as warriors. We paid them on market days. So they could immediately translate that money into cattle, which is what they wanted. And then over time, because we said, well, we can give you the wealth that you were getting through lion killing, but how on earth do we give you the status? It seemed very hard to replicate that. And they said, well, we would love to know how to read or write because only one person in the village could read or write. And this was a huge status symbol. So Education. I actually, I wouldn't have really mm. thought of it because again, I was stuck in this view that these are traditional warriors and they don't want to do this kind of stuff. But there was a real desire. So now we've trained them all. They're all literate and numerate. They go once a year to either Kenya or Northern Tanzania to go and do training with other lion guardians and others in similar programs. They, you know, because they now have passports, they know how to use GPS equipment. They are, they're really, they're becoming the guys in the community. If someone has a problem, they go to one of these guys. And because of that, we've seen the women now say, we used to want our daughters to marry lion killers, but now we want them to marry lion defenders, which is what we call them locally. Because they are now, all those things about being a warrior can be replicated in this way. And it was, it was actually a very good time for it because that kind of killing isn't legal in most cases in Tanzania. And so there was increasing pressure that they couldn't do this as much. You know, they, they can't go into the national park and kill. There was sometimes, you know, a lot of attention if they killed on village land. So so it was it was a good time actually to say, well, maybe there's a different way of enabling you to get what you get from this, but through lion conservation rather than lion killing. And it hasn't been flawless. There have been some groups that definitely want to do it, that value that. But if in general you get the community invested in something and you get it to be something they have developed that answers their needs, then it's much more uh, long lasting. Amazing. So, yeah, this is very, this is very much a story of uh, poacher term, turn gamekeeper and guardian. I'm interested 
with and, and this has come to light um, so dramatically right now with the current situation, the, the, the global pandemic and, and the lockdown and the, the lack of funding, which is going to many places around the world, particularly in Africa, uh, which is used for conservation through, you know, whether that be um, hunting or whether that be just photographic tourism, a lot of those streams of revenue have dried up rather rapidly and unexpectedly. How how are you funding this shift, uh, this, this shift in uh, the culture so that you're compensating in, in a different manner through, through monetary means um, to be able to pay them to go and track lions, to be able to, to buy their cattle. Yeah. So it's, we are fun- I think we, we rely on philanthropy a lot and we also rely on people traveling around the world, which is a system that has really broken down recently. Definitely. And for our work, it particularly relies, you say, on philanthropy. It relies on everything from, I mean, zoos have been one of our major funders. And zoos have absolutely obviously been hit extremely hard by COVID-19 because they've had to close and and they're really struggling to keep their own uh, operations going, let alone be able to fund externally, even though many of them still are. But it's it's one of these things that we've talked all the last 10 years when I've been writing grant applications for this. There's usually a little box that says, how is this work sustainable beyond the life of the grant? And I say in most cases it isn't because there's such a disconnect between the value ascribed to these species internationally and the value ascribed to them locally, that if we don't effectively take that money internationally and put it in locally, then we are not going to get, as we've talked about before, they will switch to other more profitable forms of using that land. And so, of course, this has brought into very sharp relief the then that issues related to relying on external funding. Some of the work that we do, because the Lion uh, Guardians, the Lion Defenders part of it is only a part of it. So some of it is about you know, training people and how best to protect their livestock. And so we have conflict officers in the villages who really teach people best practices who, because we do everything from school feeding programs to female empowerment work, there's lots of things that people have started to recognize the value in these species. And even if, and of course, because a lot of those things actually last longer, the women getting more education, um, the children starting finishing their secondary school and having more choices in where they go. All these things have a longer sort of tail effect that go beyond even this next year of funding. And what it does, I think, is it recognises locally that the wildlife has a value, even if in this next year we have a dip in the funding and there are certain programmes we have to pull back. There's been a recognition that they are with an internationally valued resource. And I think that's something that is a a real shift in perception that's very valuable there. Um, One of our biggest programmes that we work on is something called community camera trapping, which is a very direct monetary incentive where we were doing camera trapping on the village land and everyone was stealing the camera traps. We were meanwhile doing benefit programs of education and healthcare and veterinary, and people were taking the benefits and still killing the wildlife, which, uh, why wouldn't you? And so we ended up bringing these two things together. And so the villagers now are trained and employed to do the camera trapping. And for each village, the more wild animals they camera trap on their land, the more points they generate. And then those points are directly translated into extra healthcare, education and veterinary benefits. So this has become a huge driver of local community development. And while that is absolutely reliant on external funding coming in, it certainly changed the perception locally that they have something of value. And it's worth hanging on to it even during lean times, I think, because that value has been recognised. I remember not that long ago, we had a group of young men who were going to go out on a hunt, a lion hunt. And it was the women in the community who stood up and said, Uh, you are killing the very thing that is enabling us to give birth safely and educate our children, and we're not having it. And the women themselves, nothing to do with us, put in a lion and elephant hunting ban in those communities. So that was really showing that they had really sort of internalized the potential value of maintaining these species, even with the risks they still still sort of occur with them there. So I think there will be a dip from COVID-19, and we absolutely need more resilient models. We need different models. We need things like carbon... Uh, credits and long-term habitat agreements. We need direct payments for wildlife, I think, from international communities down to these landscapes that aren't contingent on people going there and whether it's tourism or trophy hunting or whatever, that it's just more of an international agreement to pay these uh, countries for maintaining the biodiversity that the whole globe relies upon. But we do need more mechanisms and that's been really exemplified through this. Yeah, because we we spend a lot of time uh, in our in our comfortable houses, in places like where I am right now, up in Scotland, or you down down in England, or in North America, writing and talking about the incredible biodiversity and how important these landscapes are in places like Africa and the wildlife that exists there. 
And we can talk all day long, but unless we are prepared to help fund these to exist in the future, they simply won't be there anymore. And I, I think this is another thing we discuss about on the podcast a lot, which is this notion that if we just were to uh, leave it alone and remove ourselves from that landscape, then things would return to the way they, in inverted commas, should be. I, I think the problem is that what is that baseline? And there, there is this very romantic notion that uh, wildlife could exist in the way it did a million years ago without realizing that we have changed that landscape so much that the most irresponsible thing we could possibly do is to have a hands-off approach. I don't know if that's something that, that you would agree with or not, but um, it, it's a conversation I have a lot with people. Absolutely, 100 cents. And I think when you have these discussions, it's fascinating that it's always about other people. So people, particularly when you're talking about Africa, people will say, look, you know, basically it's African people, they're having all these children, they are taking up the space that's meant for wildlife. When you turn the tables and you say, okay, look, in the UK, for instance, we are having a devastating impact on UK wildlife, despite all the intrinsic value we ascribe to it, despite, despite the fact that we are rich and we're wealthy and we could do a lot more, we're still not doing it. So People are never willing to take themselves and their families, you know, impacts really to heart and say, actually, I'm going to live in a way that's completely uh, impact free. And we cannot expect others to live in a way that we won't. So I think if I had to choose between my child and a lion, I would choose my child. And everyone is going to make that choice, I think. So, So you have to just recognize how do you approach this with humanity and with compassion and with an understanding that everyone wants a decent standard of living. And my true belief is that we can deliver that better standard of living, that more, you know, greater equality and fairness, if we do it using nature as a vehicle for that, if you, because we do all value this, we have amazing value to nature, both, you know, the existence value and the real economic value of nature, it's huge. So if we can monetize that, I know many people don't like it, but I think if we can monetize it down to the local level, make local people truly partners in this and the real custodians and stakeholders of it, they will want to rebuild nature to a stage where, it delivers human development. So you're not seeing conservation and development as antagonizing forces, but where conservation delivers development in a holistic way. And I really think we can get there, but it has to be not in this lecturing way from afar, afar that you often see it. Mm. I, I didn't want to make this uh, conversation uh, focused at its core about trophy hunting, which is one of the reasons I've kind of left it um, towards the end. But I, it is something that has come up a lot in, in the last 12 months. And uh, I, I know I actually had, um, who I know you know, um, Professor Adam Hart, who was on the podcast um, a couple of weeks back. And we, we basically dedicated a whole podcast to, to talking about trophy hunting and, and his understanding of it and, ex- talk, and explaining the landscape in Africa and the current necessity for it in some places. I was wondering if you can just expand a little bit maybe on the conversation that I had with him in in particular relevance to the area that you're working in in Tanzania. Uh, Where does it take place? Is it important? Are you really seeing economic value to it? It's I know it's a, it's a very difficult concept for somebody to wrap their head around this idea. You've, we, we've just spent 50 minutes talking about the conservation of lions and big cats and stopping the killing of lions. And now we're about to talk about this idea that, as it stands in some places, maybe it is for the benefit of the species – a good idea to have trophy hunting and actually kill one of these animals, the very thing that you're trying to stop local communities do. How does that work? So my aim always is to say, I want to reduce the overall level of killing of these species, because that is what we're seeing at the moment is unsustainably high levels of killing, particularly in areas where they have none of this value, like on village land. So the amount of killing that we saw on village land when we started the project was a hundred times higher than you would have had in a trophy hunting area. So, or would have been permitted in a trophy hunting area, maybe, you know, a little bit more killing, but it was hugely higher, orders of magnitude higher. And even worse than that, in trophy hunting areas, you tend to have some regulations, again, sometimes catchy, sometimes not, but there are regulations on taking older animals and taking males in particular. The animals that we see being killed through conflict, for example, are 
Half of them are female, as you'd expect from any sort of random killing. Many of them are pregnant or lactating females. So we see all these adult females being taken out of a population. All the science that we have on lion population is that if you take away the adult females, the reproductively active females, you will drive that population to extinction far more quickly than if you're taking away the males. So we had a very unsustainable amount of killing. Now, setting the scene for what this looks like, particularly in Tanzania, in Tanzania, trophy hunting occurs in game reserve. So these are areas on the on the outside of national parks often. So they're often bordering national parks. For instance, in Ruaha, we have big game reserves up to the north of Ruaha, and that's where most of the trophy hunting will occur. Now, people instinctively say, well, that's terrible. You know, these animals are in a national park and they step out onto a game reserve and they get shot by a trophy hunter. Yeah, we hear that all the time. Yeah, yeah all the time. They're being lured out of the park and all the rest of it. The problem is that you've always got to look at the counterfactuals. What would happen without that trophy hunting in that case there? So say you take away that game reserve, then you'd have what happens on the southern border of Raha National Park, which is where most of our work is done, on village land. So say the national park goes straight into village land. There is no economic reason then for people to maintain wild habitat there. There is no reason for people to put up with the presence of lions. So what you end up with is far more killing, exactly the kind of killing that we see. Lots of poisoning, lots of snaring, lots of spearing. And these deaths are horrible. They involve, as we mentioned, really, really damaging er uh, sections of the population that are taken out. And they're horrible deaths. I don't think anyone would want to see an animal poisoned and writhing around for hours and hours, caught in a snare. These are terrible deaths. So when I talk to people about it, I completely understand the fact that innately the idea of killing this incredible animal for fun is horrifying. It's horrifying to me. You know, I'm a vegetarian. I've dedicated my life to reducing wildlife killing. But what the trophy hunting does is it secures vast amounts of habitat. And the main threat to lions is habitat loss. And so what you'll do is it's, you'll have a park like Ruaha, and you have about the same area again of, of game reserves, of trophy hunting area around it. And if we meet, if that trophy hunting becomes non-viable because of pressures from campaigning around the world, etc., then it will be converted into farmland, it will be converted into, you know, settlement, and there will be no space there for lions. So what you're probably doing is taking away what can be a minor threat, and you are then, you know, massively amplifying the major threats to these species. That's what none of us want. So whenever people talk about trophy hunting, I say to them, I would be hugely supportive if there are campaigns to effectively replace trophy hunting with, you know, with a different wildlife based land use that minimizes wildlife killing. But you could secure that habitat, all the other species. You could still deliver the economic benefits to the national government, at least for maintaining wildlife habitat. But if you can't do that, if you take it away without those alternatives present, you will make it worse. And that's unfortunately where we are seeing it right now. In Tanzania, many, many, many of the hunting blocks have been abandoned. Most of them since, uh, you know, since the changes in the US, particularly in terms of the importation there of trophies. Um, and we are just seeing that that's never discussed in these campaigns. No one ever looks at the what the unintended consequences are of taking away this revenue. And we see it on the ground. We see very clearly that if you have a vacant hunting block, the amount of poaching in there goes up, the amount of uh, habitat clearance goes up. This has huge impacts, not only on lions, but on many other species as well. So we have to do this in a sensible way, again, in, in really in close consultation with the people most affected, with the range governments, with the communities that are involved, with whatever economic mechanism, whether it's trophy hunting or tourism. Those people need to make their decisions and those decisions need to be supported and not undermined if there are no better alternatives on the table. I, I assume within these vast hunting blocks, there are still uh, local indigenous communities living within them, and they're able to get benefit from the hunting that's going on, either through economic compensation or um, actually em employment or, or meat. The, I, I'm guessing that there is some sort of system so that they are not um, killing lions or setting snares or or poaching uh, bushmeat for, for food? Well, so it certainly varies a lot by location and by country. You know, you've got trophy hunting places like Namibia, obviously, we talked about earlier, where that tends to be done in a lot of these conservancies where it's absolutely managed by the local people as the key stakeholders. Yeah, they're brilliant, the conservancies yeah, there. It's an amazing they work really because, well. Yeah, because that goes right down to the local level. In places like mm. Tanzania, local people aren't you know, meant to be living in the game reserves there. So there will be some sort of small level jobs. There will be some meat distributed from the trophies. What the benefit tends to be there is the benefit to the national government of having a revenue from these large tracts of land that are set aside for wildlife. So exactly really like tourism. 
in that in many cases in ecotourism, you don't actually have very significant benefits going down to the local communities beyond some seasonal jobs, some smaller level <clears throat> benefits to certain households. But it does provide a very big economic incentive for the governments to get some revenue. And that revenue often gets fed back into things like the wildlife division. So that does form a very important part of the mechanism of protecting the wider suite of protected areas across the country. So you have to understand the, the systems and you have to be very respectful and considerate of what would happen if something was taken away. And again, taking it away is as horrible as many people feel it is. And I completely concur with that feeling. I just think the sort of killings that we see are invisible internationally. They're not on social media, but they are horrible and they are real and they are even more impactful than the trophy hunting killing in terms of conservation. So for me, it would be a huge disservice to lions if you took away the trophy hunting and just left it and massively increased these other types of killings. And that is what we're heading towards because we don't see a scalable, viable alternative uh, on the table at present. And I'm, I'm all very keen to work with whoever we can to think about what those mechanisms might look like. But let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. Let's not take away the mechanisms we have right now before having a better alternative in place. So you are, I mean, this is kind of repeating the point, but I'm just, I'm curious. The hunting blocks that have been abandoned or given back to the government because they are they're rented for a period of of time, these concessions, what is actually happening in them? Or do we do we know for a fact that we're seeing uh, reductions in populations of, of game across the board, along with uh, along with lions and, and habitat destruction and trees being cut down? Is this is this visually what is happening on the ground? Yes, we definitely do know that, and it's something we're looking at around Ruaha at the moment. We're looking at other blocks in Tanzania, and we're looking at things like the forest cover as an index of habitat conversion. And we see that vacant blocks are definitely suffering worse than occupied trophy hunting blocks. So, and there's a lot of discussion. Some people will say, well, maybe the blocks were, were made vacant because people had just mismanaged them for so long that they just abandoned them. It seems to me extremely unlikely that everyone would abandon them at the same time just after those new restrictions were in place. So I think it's much more likely that the economics made it non-viable. And then what you see, of course, is that the government does not have the capacity to throw in all that extra money towards anti-poaching, towards habitat protection, and people are in real need. So if they've also lost their jobs, much as people say internationally, oh, it doesn't really matter. It's such a small amount of revenue that goes to the local mm. people. That to me seems really arrogant when it you're is, dealing with yeah. a family for whom that revenue, small as it might seem, on a GDP level, it was hugely important to that person and that family. And if well, you that was survival for them. Anything, yeah, it's survival. Of course, they're going to go in and then use the forest either to cut it down, charcoal clearing, um, bushmeat poaching. You you bring people back down to that level of need and direct extraction of resources in a way that is unregulated, at least, you know, effectively unregulated. And so, and then eventually, if that goes on for long enough, what you have is these areas, you know, very likely to be degazetted to other forms of land use because they become less valuable to the government for wildlife, they become less valuable in terms of the wildlife they actually maintain. And so it becomes this cascade effect. And I think everyone out there who's considering, you know, signing these petitions and doing all of these, please just really Think about it a bit more and make sure you're really supporting these organizations that are working on the ground that have some idea of the complexities of these things, because they always say every problem is simple from a distance. And I think that's very true with something like trophy hunting, whereas when you get into the, the heart of it, you have to think about the unintended consequences of taking it away without the better alternatives. It's a, it's a very complex subject. I want to get on just before we wrap up to talk about uh, Nat Geo and uh, women in conservation. But just because this was something that, that came up and I, I want to get some some very clarity straight from you as to what happened here. When the there was the meeting in Parliament to discuss the potential trophy hunting ban, where I believe Zach Goldsmith was there and um, a handful of other people, and you went in attendance and were chucked out or asked to leave, can you can you explain exactly what happened there? Because I'd I'd love just to concisely get the truth, because there was a lot of stuff going around on various um, platforms of so social media at the time. Yeah, so this was a meeting that we'd heard about through somebody who posted on Twitter or something about this meeting that was being run by the campaign to ban trophy hunting. Um, in So it was a meeting in Parliament. It was very unclear from what we'd been sent on, whether it was an open meeting. We had met with, I'm trying to put, remember the, type, the timeline, but, all, but anyway, we discussed with Zach Goldsmith's office because we, we saw that he was on it, whether it was an open meeting. They, they seemed very unclear about it. I'm a member of the IUCN Sustainable Use and Livelihood Specialist Group so I talked with the head of the group, so I happened to be in London at that time. And she said, well, look, just go along 
and see whether it's an open meeting, see whether it's very important, because there are such passionate groups about this, to really listen and understand all the different views on different sides. So I went along, it was the next day, yeah, we had no lead time. I went on the next day to see if it was open or invite only. It was very clearly open. It was an open space, an open room off the main hall in Parliament. There was no guest list. There was nobody asking names. There was nothing. So I walked in and then literally immediately I was in there. I heard someone say, oh, there's Amy Dickman. And I was amazed because, A, they didn't want to really recognise me. But, you know, they, <laughs> but all that I was seen as somehow antagonistic. So someone came up and asked what I was doing there. And I said, look, I'm here as a, as a representative of the IUCN, Sustainable Use uh, and Livelihood Specialist Group, and literally, I'm not going to say anything. I'm just going to listen because it's very important for us, much as we did with the tribal warriors in Tanzania, is to listen to very different points of view. To observe and to, and to think where are our common grounds, where are the drivers where we both have a shared interest that we can work on. Um, that didn't go down well at all, and ultimately... It was just difficult, but ultimately they were very clear they wanted me to leave. Even when I pointed out that actually as an IUCN representative, this was something that the decision making in Parliament is very important for us to know about. And so they just told me I had to go, which was disappointing. That seems seems bizarre. I mean, what was the makeup of the room? Like who were who was having a discussion about what? Were you even able to to glean that before you were asked to leave? So we knew that it was being run by this organization called the Campaign to Ban Trophy Hunting. Um, mm -hmm. They are very this much is Eduardo Conclaves, group. is it? And yeah, and Eduardo Gonzalez yeah. and their That's, yeah and their group. So they were just and Zach Goldsmith and the organising MP was Tracy Crouch, and she was very. When I explained to her later, because when I said to Dillis Rowe, who's the head of the specialist group, that this has happened, she said this is shocking and it shouldn't have happened. You should have been able to go in there and listen to an open meeting. They shouldn't have thrown you out, and that. But Eduardo was there and he came up and said very openly, you have to leave or I'm going to get security to throw you out. And I thought, just why? This, if we can never talk to people who have different views from us, it is a very sad state of affairs. And so later on, Tracy Crouch's um, office were very good and their representative there was very nice at the time. And, and then they, she met with us later at Parliament to talk about this. And she said, you know, I don't want to be told who I can and can't listen to. And we said we're very into having open, inclusive discussions about this. And the more we talk in just our little silos and the more we only talk to people who think like we think, the more polarised and the more difficult these discussions are going to be. We have to be able to come to a shared space and have that yeah. effect. You're not the enemy. <laughs> you shouldn't be the enemy. I said to the person when I was standing there in the brief moments before I was thrown out, I said to somebody who seemed to be horrified, I was there, I said, look, everyone in this room is passionate about wildlife. So few people in the world are passionate about wildlife to the extent of the people here. So we must be able to use that passion and say, okay, say we all dislike trophy hunting, even if many people agree on that. How do we work out those mechanisms, those alternatives and demonstrate they're viable? So that could be a route forward rather than just paint, you know, painting each other as the enemy. I think there is way too much polarization. And I know they, so I know particularly we were disliked strongly by the campaign to ban trophy hunting because way back when, in sort of 10 years ago, our project received funding, a small grant from the Dallas Safari Club. At the time, I said to I said to them, and it's come up numerous times since, including the media, and I've said to people, I strongly believe that we need field conservation funding from all sides. We need it from trophy hunters, we need it from tourists, we need it from the general public who never gets to go out to Africa. We need to form that community. And you can disagree with somebody's views, you can disagree with what they do, but we need to focus on the shared the shared passion that we have, and through that, we can come up with better solutions. But if we never talk to each other, we never work to each other, it is just very unlikely to get much better. Do you have any insight as to where that conversation and the DEFRA consultation has got to? Uh, obviously, with everything that's been going on in the world, that's kind of gone quiet at the moment. Yeah, apparently, it was always going to be quite a long, um, sort of a long, drawn out process in that they had the public consultation, it was extended a little bit, so lots of submissions were put in. Uh, they will now be looking through the submissions and make a decision. I mean, they, you know, there seems to be a lot of desire in government to stop the import of trophies. And we met with Zach Goldsmith and with others. And yet the, clearly, again, the passion for African wildlife is really strong there. But we have to make sure, and our point is really again and again, that there are steps that are recommended by the IUCN and how these decisions have to be made. They have to be made in con consultation with local people, with the exploration of full alternatives that have to be funded. If these steps are taken, then we can sort of all move forward together. But just doing a, just saying, okay, the UK is going to ban the import, which I suspect will be the way they go forward, 
just is very much, it seems like a sticking plaster on something where then you're going to have these massive amounts of killing on the ground if we don't invest similar amounts of funding in protecting those areas and delivering conservation benefits to those people. It seems to me strange that there is this lack of will to embrace and listen to the science delivered by the very people who know the most. And I find this confusing because in most other aspects of of government and, and consultation, that is what gets leaned on continually as a, as a defense for their decision making is, well, the science says, I mean, we, we see it right now with the, the coronavirus pandemic, the science says this, so these are the actions we are taking. And yet, in this case, that is absolutely not the, uh, not the circumstance. You probably know more about wildlife uh, conflict with regard to, to lions in Africa than most people on the planet. And yet, in that instance, you weren't even allowed to observe, never mind contribute. Yeah, well, I think people, it's totally true. And Adam and I, you talked about chatting to him the other week. We talked about how in the coronavirus discussions, it's all been about those on the front lines, respecting the people on the front lines and listening to the science. I mean, that's obviously not just a singular thing. But in the end, we, we were saying we hope that that translates to conservation, where it should be those people who are on the front lines, in inverted commas, that really understand these, that are listened to. The reason it doesn't get listened to, I think, is because uh, and this may be controversial, but I think people like simple slogans. They like they like a very clear narrative. You know, trophy hunting is one of those ones where it's so simple. There are bad guys. You know, lions are under threat. These animals that we love and rich Westerners are going over and shooting the last few, and that's horrifying and should stop. It's such a simple narrative. It is very um, simple, yeah. Very simple. And then when you come in with the science, you say, actually, if you look at the lions, the the countries they're in, Tanzania is the most important country in the world for lions largely in part because it has these huge protected areas, many of which are trophy hunting reserves. You look at uh, Zimbabwe and uh, Namibia, two countries that have increasing lion populations, they rely heavily in many areas of the country on trophy hunting. So you start to blur the boundaries and people seem to not like complexity when they talk to certainly the public, which I think is doing the public a disservice. I think the public are very used to complexity in their own lives and can cope with it, can say, I see the fact that I dislike trophy hunting, but I also dislike poisoning. So I don't want to take trophy hunting away if it ends up with 10 times more poisoning. And that's the kind of thing that we have to have those open discussions about. But I think, to be honest, when you get people like me in saying stuff like that, it, it's difficult for a group that is trying to fundraise and raise support off a very simple message because it muddies the water and it, it makes it just less clear. And that doesn't go with sort of a lobbying group. No, very true. Now, I want to move away from this as we as we bring this conversation to a close. You mentioned uh, the support from Nat National Geographic at the start. You are a Nat Geo explorer. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are involved uh, to a greater or lesser extent with Nat Geo. It's an amazing organization and, and they have this incredible esteem with anybody who is involved in them and they, they've been producing some incredible documentaries in well, for a long time, but particularly in recent years. What is uh, What was your involvement? How did that come about? So it came about through, they started their national, I mean, obviously I knew Nat Geo as everyone does. And again, like you say, totally iconic and amazing. Uh, I got a grant from them. They just started their National Geographic Big Cats initiative. They started that in 2010. And that was the same year that we were just starting up the field work in, uh, in Oaxaca. So it, I looked into it and I just saw that this was something they were starting. So I went over to National Geographic and met some of the people there and gave a talk and and they were really excited by the whole thing. I got one of their first grants. In fact, I got their very first ever Big Cats Initiative grant. And it was just right from that start, it was a really natural sort of partnership where, you know, they love the elements of, you know, the storytelling and the conservation action, the local community engagement. And obviously, Nat Geo brings for us far more, well, it brings credibility and it brings uh, just visibility that we would never have sitting in Oaxaca. So it's always so amazing to go over. And it's such an honor always to go back to Nat Geo and to talk there and to think of all the footsteps of the amazing explorers that have, you know, walked through those walls and told their stories and had the support. And I love that it's such a dynamic uh, institution. It's so, it's just such a great hub of people. The people, you know, the explorer community that make up Nat Geo are so dynamic and diverse and supportive of each other. And I love that. I think you see that passion for nature in all of them and that passion for the stories and learning and a thirst for knowledge. And I think it's just, I love the relationship with them. It's really good. And they've been supporters ever since 2010. So yeah, it's something that we are keen to develop and continue strengthening. Amazing. Uh, through our conversation, you've, you've listed off a number of 
incredible woman involved in, in conservation. And, and I'm wondering if you cast your mind back 20 years where this kind of story really, really began for you. Was it different? How have you seen the landscape change for women involved in these kind of roles? Because it very much was not commonplace historically. It was it's a field that has been dominated by men for a long time. And and we look at the you know the 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 sort of the, the great icons in those fields like Diane Fossey for for example, uh, who kind of led the led the way. But was that something that you were aware of or were you just so immersed in, in the work and being impassioned in what you were doing that it was never really a consideration for you or did you find barriers to what you want to do because you were a woman um, in a landscape where you were there by yourself a lot of the time, I'm assuming? Definitely. And it never really emerged to me, at least, that I recognised openly this sort of this gender issue. You, know, you mm. knew of obviously Diane Fossey and Jane Goodall and all the others, but there seemed course, to be a real... Yeah. Uh, a real sort of tax on specific bias. The primatologists all seem to be women, you know, the sort of the leaders of angels. <laughs> yeah, and then all the lion yeah. biologists, you know, there was George Schaller and Craig Packer and these amazing biologists who are all men. So it was a very male-dominated field, particularly uh, with the lion work. And it's interesting that over time, it's become something that's become more central to what we do, partly in terms of at the community level, you know, engaging the women has been fundamentally important to getting communities behind us. But more widely than that, it, it struck me that I'd spent 10 years building up this project and, and getting some real changes in terms of how much we were reducing lion killing. And you could see these benefits, but we don't have time to, to reinvent the wheel for everyone to start, as I did, sort of alone in the bush uh, and reinventing all of these things. We have to work together. And there was a group of us uh, that all happened to be women actually running lion conservation projects across Africa. And we were all sharing the frustration in this. And we said, why don't we do something about it? So we formed together, there were six of us, there are six of us, um, and we formed something called the Pride Lion Conservation Alliance. And the point behind this was to say, we will share everything openly because if I have a good idea, which is extremely unlikely, but if I had one, then I'm not going to share it with anyone else because that is my USP. Why would I share it? Because we're in a competitive field and we do not have time for conservation to be competitive. We have to be collaborative. And so we said, well, let's share everything. Our data, our ideas, our, our successes, but most importantly, our failures and our support for one another. When you are in your tent crying about the fact that it's all going horribly wrong, and yet you can't show that what it, what feels like weakness, there needs to be a safe space and a safe community that, that has your back come thick or thin. And um, and Pride has been amazing for that with me. And recently, we've, we've talked about how we expand that up to other women. And in February, we actually had the first uh, African Women's Conservation Leadership Training Program, where we said we had spaces for 30 women and we had 500 applicants for it. There's such a huge wow. desire for women to be involved in this. It's something we really want to work and scale up. And I think Pride's been amazing at that. And it's actually something that on a more personal level and talking back to Nat Geo, I remember just after I had my second child, originally I thought, I never thought about the conflict between family and and sort of exploration or field work because I was convinced I didn't want marriage and babies and somehow my husband persuaded me of both. And, uh, <laughs> and um, I remember being at the Nat Geo Explorers Festival and I just had my second baby and he was about, I don't know, three weeks old, maybe, I don't remember, but I was giving a talk. And so I thought, well, I, I could leave this baby at the back, but, you know, then he'll start crying and it'll be a nightmare. So I just thought, oh, I'll wear him in a, you know, in a papoose. And so I got up on stage and I was talking and it was so funny because this picture of me talking with the Nat Geo sign behind and the baby and the papoose became the most tweeted image of the whole festival. And it was so crazy to me that we have these amazing explorers that have climbed the highest mountains and the bottoms of the ocean. And the most amazing image is woman holds baby. And you think we have, things have become very unbalanced if that's the case. And it led to this amazing discussion afterwards during the festival with all these young female explorers who came up and said, I always thought I had to choose between either a family or sort of doing this kind of field work. And it turned out that all the women on the panel had children, but we'd never thought to discuss it because it seems unprofessional as a woman to discuss it. It seems like you're being weak or is that sure fact it takes a lot of strength to do it all and no one can do it all without support. So, and it was a great thing. We, we ended up sort of totally shifting the program and talking about this a lot. And that geo to their immense credit said, what is the biggest, one of the biggest issues of this? How, what are the, problems with doing it you know in a, in a realistic sense and I said well it's about funding you know you either have to pay extra childcare at home or you have to pay to have your baby and somebody come with you on field work and it's just it's an extra thing that you can't get grant money for and they 
put in place an, an explorer's fund that specifically is for people with caring responsibilities to enable exactly that, people to go out and, and explore even while they've to balance you know, these areas of your life because we all have a wider life than just our work and you have to make people feel supported in all areas of that if you want them to have the long, yeah, the longevity in it. Yeah, I, I didn't know that um, Nat Geo had uh, funding in place for that. That's incredible. Yeah, it was really good. So, uh, yeah, it's great. So it's really good to see people being adaptive at that, at you know, the funder level, and also just giving that that it sounds totally, yeah, you know, it sounds really to say inspiration. But it gives that sort of uh, visibility to younger people coming up to think. Actually, I don't have to choose between these two desires. I can if do I both. Have support. If, I can if do you, both. If you show us, yeah, yeah, we need the support. Amy, what a fascinating conversation with you today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your day and uh, wrangling the kids downstairs so that we could have a conversation. <laughs> um, I hope at some point in the future I might get a chance to, to meet you in person. And uh, I'm Very actually, much. If, if, if we're allowed to travel at some point, I actually have some work due over in Tanzania quite soon. Oh, good. <laughs> um, so you never know. Maybe I'll be out in the field potentially. How, how, how often do you get out now? Are you, do you still split your time between the two places or are you at home more than you're in the field now i do split my time but i am definitely at home well since the two-year-old it's just become a lot harder to get out there more and we have also a fantastic project team that's out there so we have you know over 70 people we built up to with the project um you know it's all scaled back with coronavirus just with people going back to their homes but we have amazing project managers and things so there's slightly less need for me to be there now which is a bit sad i'm slightly <laughs> still so i tend to do a bit more of the moment right now uh you know more of the home stuff and also talking a lot with donors and building support for it and looking at how we can expand more widely these models to other places in Africa and think about how we grow that community again so that we're not all reinventing the wheel. Mm, that's great. Well, it, it's a great privilege to be able to tell a little bit of your story to our audience. So thank you very much, Amy. No, thank you very much for the time. It's great. Thanks, Byron. Thanks for listening. Tune in next week when we all take another walk into the wilderness. <laughs>